Welcome back, my lords and ladies, to the Cast Beyond the Wall. We are your guide to all things Westerosi, and we're here to bring you a review, analysis, and fan v fan debate of each episode of HBO's hit show, Game of Thrones. And this week, we're reviewing the season six premiere, The Red Woman. I'm your host, Caleb Masters, and I swear by the old gods and the new ones that Stannis Baratheon has been robbed, okay? I am joined, of course, by three other voices from around the internet. I'm very excited to introduce you to my co-host for, uh, first, uh, the man, the Stark Believer, sir. I'm Daniel Stoll, and this episode we see Melisandre without an Instagram filter. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hey, you know that's what? a lesson for all you people on Tinder. She's uh, she's still got those, she's still got those eyebrows and cheekbones. I'm all about it. It's got it where it counts. <laughs> wow, Austin Lucari here, and uh, you know I want to tell all you folks out there: never let good meat go to waste. The, hey, you know what? Very He's practical. Not I, I don't like to waste meat. I mean, there's nothing worse than when you have like meat that's rotting in your fridge and you forgot to cook it. Definitely the worst. Eat it to the dogs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are your host of the cast beyond the wall and uh, we are a uh, part of the good trash media network this season our host my home uh and uh, what better way to kick off the season by having another voice from the good trash media join us this week uh if you listen if you've been listening the last couple of years uh you'll be familiar with my, our guest host this week uh sir can you introduce yourself Hello, Caleb. It is me, Dalton Stewart, from uh, the Good Trash Genre Cast and the People's History of Film. Um, I'm so excited uh, that we were able to uh, move the cast beyond the wall over to Good Trash Media. Um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, guest host with you for the last two seasons, I want to say. Two, uh, yeah. When you, yeah, when you used to produce this for um, We've Got This Covered dot com. Uh, but I'm so excited that we're doing this for Good Trash Media now because uh, I like you, I like Austin, I like Daniel, and I really like talking about Game of Thrones. In that order. Yeah, we're really glad to bring it to you guys, too. It's like having it all under in one home, under one roof. Uh, we're house good trash officially now. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so, yeah, really excited to have Dalton back on again. So he's a, he's a veteran uh, guest host. So he, he, uh, he came back a third, a third time. So, yeah, we are part of the Good Trash Media Network. It's a website dedicated to taking your experience watching uh, TV and film beyond the screen and onto your podcast listening device. Uh, why? Because we believe that TV and film is so much more than 90 minutes in a bu- bucket of popcorn, or in this case, uh, 60 minutes in a glass of Dornish wine. Now, you can track all of the posts, uh, all of our posts here on the Cast Beyond the Wall at goodtrashmedia.com. And if you want to interact with us, uh, you know, talk with us here about what you thought about this week's episode of Game of Thrones, uh, hit us up on Twitter at good underscore trash and tweet us or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash good trash media and go ahead and uh, hit a post. We really want to hear what you guys think of each episode of Game of Thrones this season. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and, and head into our discussion of the Red Woman. We're going to go ahead and get some initial impressions. Uh, what, how good was it? Was the episode good? Did we like it? Was it, was it bad? What did we like? What didn't we like? Uh, briefly, because uh, then we're going to go ahead and move into a scene-by-scene recap and analysis. Uh, so I will start with you, Mr. Austin Okari. What did you think of this week's uh, episode, The Red Woman? It was a solid episode for uh, a season premiere. Um, it did more than just recap the previous season, which I always appreciate. It actually started to get some new storylines going or at least um, get us moving on where the storylines did left off, leave off. Um, I was surprised, not surprised, I guess um, uh, it was, I thought it was interesting. It focused almost entirely on the female characters of the show. Yes. Like across the board, it was almost all dominated by female characters, which is great. Good to see. Fantastic. Uh, you know, talking about ladies in Game of Thrones, I think that's going to be a recurring. Uh, that's going to be a theme we're going to hit on later in the episode, uh, and hopefully, I think, uh, I think a theme that we're going to be talking about a lot this season, considering who our lead players are at this point. Um, but uh, I got to go swing to my man Daniel Stoll. What did you think of the uh, season six premiere? I thought it was good overall. I think there's some definitely some weak spots, uh, but it's definitely a premiere episode. We're catching back up with all the characters. Uh, we're figuring out where they're at and starting, like Austin said, we're starting some of these new storylines. Um, there were some, I thought some parts, the writing was kind of weak. For Game of Thrones, um, I think it it hits the hits the bar, but it doesn't exceed it. Um, and then if you compare it to other shows, I think it's going to beat most other shows as a premiere episode. Um, but I think it just barely hit the bar for a Game of Thrones premiere, and it didn't go above that. Okay, okay, that's fair. All right, uh, Dalton Stewart, what did you think of the season six opener? 
Well, I'm, I'm glad Austin mentioned the uh, focus on our lady characters this episode because it was something I noticed as well. Uh, it's something I really appreciated. Um, you know, Game of Thrones gets a lot of credit for the strength of its female characters, but I feel like over the last two seasons, um, it, it's been a little weak in places, especially um, with the confusing sex stuff uh, that uh, we've talked about at length on this program uh, between Cersei and Jamie. Um, and the complete ball dropping that was Dorne last season. Um, so it was nice to see Dorne actually get some traction within the first episode. Uh, it was nice to see uh, get a lot of uh, really good stuff from Cersei. Um, and it was um, overall, uh, as Austin said, a really great service to the female characters of Game of Thrones, which are one of the show's strengths. Um, but as Daniel said, you know, it's a premiere episode. It's got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, table setting to do. Um, not quite as much as last season, where it was essentially a, a, almost a neat uh, or a, a soft reboot of the show, where there were so many things in flux. Uh, it was definitely a lot more focused than the premiere of last year. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a premiere episode, and when you've got a cast of you know, thirty fucking people, uh, you got a lot of work to do uh, in your first episode. But I think overall, um, fair to middling, uh, but definitely closer to the good side uh, of that sort of thing. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I really liked it too. I, I think um, I'm kind of right in the middle. I I wasn't blown away by it, but you know, it's I was like when it was done, I was like, oh, well, that was the first episode. I, I knew I wasn't gonna get, you know, there wasn't gonna be big wow moments or anything like that. Uh, and it's always weird when you get so excited about Game of Thrones coming back, and that first episode's always like, you know, a first episode. Uh, so you're like, oh yeah, fired up, and then it just is kind of oh, okay. Well, well, Game of Thrones, it's it's back. That's really the, my, my big takeaway. Is hey. It's back. I'm really, really excited about some of the storylines they're setting up here. Um, I'm really excited to be in the dark on a lot of this stuff. Uh, and um, I do really appreciate that uh, the, the ladies almost exclusively ate the screen time, with the exception of Tyrion and Varys um, kind of having their own scene. And then even even the... On, onion night a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, the, little, the Castle Black stuff was male-driven. And even that had Melisandre in it, although she was not the... Uh, Despite the episode title, she wasn't really the main character in that particular storyline this week. Um, but, you know, no, I think a very uh, uh, almost exclusive focus on that, which is really good. But at the end of the day, you know, it, I, I still th- think back to like the season four premiere that just was like firing on all cylinders. We had the Hound and Arya eating every chicken in the room. and, and Oh, uh, man, so good. Yeah, and, and Tywin Lannister having a really great uh, talk with Tyrion. Just lots of little things like that. Mm-hmm. Um that were really, really great. But uh, overall, this is pretty solid. I, uh, a lot of promise for the next cu- upcoming episodes. And, uh, God, well, we'll, we'll get into Dorne later, but I, I have some major issues with a couple of storylines, including Dorne. So, okay, well, that's uh, that kind of uh, concludes our kind of thumbs up, thumbs down review here. But uh, let's go ahead and head into our kind of full recap of The Red Woman. Whoever you are, wherever you go, someone wants to murder you. Are you afraid? Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and start off in Marine. I'm going to save the North for last because I think that's where we've got some really juicy material this week. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start in Marine across the sea uh, with Tyrion and Varys. And uh, we get to see Tyrion and Varys. They're just walking around saying, huh. Daenerys not quite as popular as they used to be, and then you have uh, you know Tyrion. He's trying really hard to connect with the uh, the poor people on the ground, trying to figure out how to give them money, and they don't. There's a language barrier there, and it just doesn't quite connect. And uh, you know, uh, my my thought, my whole thought with this entire scene was, firstly, Tyrion Varys 2016, and then I thought, no, we can't do that because Tyrion Varys is Bernie Sanders. He's get, he's trying to give money to the poor people who don't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> there's a language bear. He's trying really hard to help them, and they're like not speaking his language. They're like, "Oh, we don't, we don't like you, so you don't get our vote." Um, so I, I, the whole time I was just like, "Oh my god, he's giving handouts, and they're not taking it." Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty introductory scene, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Just him. It, it really was just establishing that they're doing their thing. Um, I don't know. Did you guys have any big takeaways from the scene? It was pretty brave of them to be walking around. I think the streets of of Marine after what had just happened. They're just walking around, no guards, nothing. And people know who they are. It's not like they're unknown at this point. 
Um, I mean, and there is even the hint of it where people are watching them everywhere they go. You know, you kind of saw that that shadowy figure there behind the wall or whatever. But um, I that to me spells or kind of uh, is is foretelling a little bit of danger for uh, for Tyrion, and maybe he's a little bit too confident in his abilities right now. Um, so we'll see how it goes, I guess. But uh, I, I think he's going to, if he continues to be as, um, uh, I'm missing the word, but if he continues to to act as brave as he's acting, um, say, he's probably going to pay a price for it. Would you say arrogant, maybe? Uh, arrogant's not really the word I'm looking for either, but I can use that if it would be better. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, Daniel, did you have any big takeaways from the, the short uh, Varys Tyrion uh, talk we had here? Well, nothing in particular. I mean, you, you kind of said, you know, it's just setting them up. Uh, hey, they're in Marine. They're going to be the ones running, seeing if they can run Marine. And uh, I mean, we did see a red priest there. So that was kind of interesting to see that, um, we know, we know a lot about Melisandre and we've seen red priests before, but uh, we saw this man talking. He was basically encouraging the crowd to, um, even though Daenerys is gone, are you guys going to stand up and you know continue to fight for yourselves? So that was kind of interesting. Maybe they're trying to set something up there. I'm not sure. And then at the end with the boats, uh, I don't know if you guys felt this, but I felt like breaking the fourth wall completely. Yeah, like the yeah. authors are saying she's not going there, guys. So don't don't look for that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, so I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, that was my exact reaction. I was like, gosh, dang it! These people but, really want to make. They really want us to know she's never going to make it. Like not this guys, season. Guys, there is one group out there who happens to have ships and has a bone to pick with Westeros. And their name is House Greyjoy. <laughs> 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 I want a full theme song, Austin. <laughs> Next week, I want the whole theme song. Uh, Bowling with his fate. I'm going to give him a peg leg and a sword he's holding up, riding in the mast. Oh, boy. Uh, Dalton, did you, uh, did you have any big takeaways from the scene? You know, uh, it, it really, for me, uh, it just kept making me think about uh, the, the greatness that was Tyrion and, and Varys in season two. Yeah. Uh, it, it really brought me back to to uh, some of my favorite stuff of this entire series, uh, which was the, um, I mean, the House of Cards, West Wing level uh, political machinations of that second season, which I really loved. Um it made me think a lot about that. Um, I, I, same as Daniel, as soon as we see that fire off of the Navy, I was just like, well, there goes the Navy. Things just uh, went from bad to worse. So uh, as is Game of Thrones fashion, uh, things never stay good for long if they ever get good at all. So uh, th- that was a big takeaway for me was uh, the, the plot of the Navy. But I think the bigger question is, well, it's not really a big question. We know who probably set fire to the Navy. It's almost certainly the Sons of the Harpy. Um, but it's definitely a big plot moment. And again, um, lights a fire under Tyrion's ass dramatically uh, in terms of what his goals for the season are, which are going to be trying to get control of the city and, and bring it under um, you know something resembling order. We're going to look back to, don't forget the occupying the Middle East analogy uh, there. I, th- I think it's still there. The Sons of the Harpies, who I think have a lot more power than we've probably given them credit for uh, up to this point. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think they're kind of in a hot water. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think at this storyline at best, we're going to get more Tyrion Varys Season 2. I do hope we get something a little more than that, honestly. But I did, as much as I did love that material, it would be nice to see the two of them do something totally different together. You make, you make a good point there, Caleb. Uh, there are definitely some, some uh, West East colonial allegories happening in that scene, for sure. You've got two white guys walking around a, a pretty ethnically uh, diverse crowd uh, trying to make it better. Um, so so there are definitely some really interesting, um, you know, and, and George R. R. Martin and, and Benioff and Weiss uh, are, are no strangers to using the, the, the fantasy elements of the show to speak to real world history. Um, but but yeah, definitely some some interesting uh, real world allegories happening there, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we talked a lot about a lot about that last season, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see if that if that's a theme that continues, um, and ultimately what the show has to say about that uh, through the way it tells its story, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and head on to uh, the next bro trip, uh, the next bro pairing, and that is Dario and Jora, apparently the world's greatest trackers ever, because they like knew they found Daenerys's ring in a random field, totally. Because I mean, if we, it. 
It was like it was like had an X marks the spot on it with that massive circle of hoof tracks. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But what I'm saying is like, they would, where would they even know to start looking? Because remember, Daenerys was on a dragon that flew away, so there wasn't any tracks to like where she got to. Hey, they found that ram that was, or was it a ram or a goat or something that was burned? So they were they were setting it up to say, hey, look, they're tracking them. They're good, you know. So it makes hey, makes sense to me. I, I mean, I would definitely. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely preferred this to three episodes of tracking uh, because they definitely could have gone that route with it. And I don't, I don't need that shit in my life. Like, yeah. let's let's keep the momentum going. Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. And honestly, I don't have that big a problem with it. It's just, a, it's just like one of those fun TV logic things that happens mm-hmm. from time to time. Even on yeah. Game of Thrones, it's uh, fun. Uh, there's, I mean, again, this is just an establishing scene. Hey, they're out looking for Daenerys. Uh, we've got uh, a little That's- bit of back and forth about uh, Dario saying, oh. You love a woman who doesn't, who clearly, really does not love you. Oh, I like to uh, imagine myself like you when I when I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Which gave us the great line that I loved: "If you ever get old." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some fun to be had there. I, I, you know, for a guy, I feel like I'm not supposed to trust like Dario. The show has a does a really great job at uh, writing a character that's so dang charming. Oh God. Did you? Did, speaking of that uh, that line, did you view that as a threat? Because right after he says it, he basically looks at his his uh, stone covered arm. Um, maybe he intends on infecting Dario. Oh my God, he's not trying to spread AIDS, Austin. I promise. I don't know. He's not that kind of monster. Not, I'm kind of skeptical, like Austin too. See, see, I'm not crazy. He's gonna rub the skin. He's gonna rub. <laughs> He's uh, he's gonna run rub his skin on Dario's skin, and they're gonna have stone mm-hmm. skin together. They'll be stone gonna, brothers, stone cooties. Oh God, this is gross. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> but that actually does take us to Daenerys, uh, who has been captured by that Dothraki. As uh, the trailers spoil for us, she was not being worshipped as a goddess. She was being pulled by a horse uh, and two guys, uh, two Dothraki soldiers, I guess. Uh, who are definitely dead, by the way. At some point in this series, those two guys, definitely dead. They're like roast Dothraki, uh, who were just kind of talking about how they would totally fuck her uh, ten ways a Sunday if she wasn't a prisoner. And, and those are, and you know, I, I want to get your back real quick, Caleb, in case our listeners have forgotten. That is almost essentially verbatim what they say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, it sounds pretty harsh, but that's pretty much what they say, and, and, and they're pretty straight up, pretty straightforward about it. And it's just see, Daenerys is being very humbled. Uh, she's just she queen of dra- mother of dragons, rules the city, and now she's a pr- almost come full circle. She's now a prisoner of the Dothraki, getting taken back into the Dothraki culture, uh, which is uh, does not is not kind to women, uh, where women are literally used to breed and have sex, and that that's it. Uh, so it's very humbling for her, and it was interesting to see how she kind of got got out of the situation. Uh, See, I, I, I pulled something different from that, Caleb, which was that uh, uh, it, I kind of, uh, she, there was a lot of really great acting going on in that scene from Amelia Clark uh, because you could almost see her thinking about, okay, been here, done this, and you kind of see the wheels turning about, I'm just going to bite my tongue until I get to the, the call uh, of, of this, uh, this group, the, of this Kalisar, and then I'm going to give them give that guy what for and be like, don't you know who the fuck I am? Um, but it was, it was kind of a great moment of her just like you could see the rage building in her eyes because you know she knows what they're saying. Uh, and she's just going to wait till she can talk to somebody in charge. No, yeah, no, no, totally. That that is all there. And she's smart. I mean, she was upset. I just again, I, this idea of being humble to me and like in this position of like, oh, I've got to deal with this crap again. <laughs> uh, you know, um, but uh, th- uh, then we actually get she gets to the camp and you, you bring it up. She she's got I've got all my cards. I'm going to play. I'm going to lay out all 18 of my titles. And the guy's like, yeah, those are worthless. Uh, they mean nothing to me. Uh, you know, you're a woman. Uh, you're a beautiful woman. And but you're and a woman. He, and he makes probably the f- that that scene there, that interaction between him and his two like friends or whatever they are. That has to be one of the funniest line, like moments of the whole thing when he's like, "Okay, it's among the top five best." <laughs> it was okay. so right. It was so funny. It was like a, a total subversion of that scene in Conan, where "What is best in life, Conan?" 
uh, to crush the enemies to see them driven before you. Um, and he was like, what's better than seeing a woman naked for the first time? Uh, taming a horse is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and killing a dude's cool too. <laughs> all right, guys, I get it. There are also other cool things in life. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what I really loved about the scene, though, um, is t- t- to borrow some parlance from another HBO show, The Wire, uh, Daenerys has this kind of moment where she's surprised that her, her name doesn't ring out. Uh, like she expects it to. The name that rings out, though, is called Drogo. Yep. Yeah, it's a it's a really smart. I, I'm glad she played that card, but that was like the last thing she had to play. She's like, "Well, I've ruled over these kingdoms, I've freed people, yada yada." And he's like, "Yeah, I don't care." Oh, but you used to be a you're a widow of Cal Drogo. Well, uh, well, we 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 can't hurt you. That's like law. We're breaking the ancient Dothraki law, apparently, to do that. Um, so we're not going to hurt you at all. But we're going to send you to an old lady's home or or a, a retiree home. Four Khaleesi's. <laughs> I thought it was kind of weird that he just believed her, like right off the bat. Like he didn't question her. I was like, "Oh, Cal Drogo. Oh, okay, sorry." Well, and but like, I just felt like there was no like, just believe this woman. Oh, I don't know. I felt like he didn't. There wasn't a lot of. I thought she, it was too easy. She had been. Des- I guarantee she had been described to him at some point because she is like a pretty unique figure amongst the Dothraki. If they knew about Cal Drogo, knew that he took a wife, they probably heard about her. I mean, you're probably right. I think it also shows how much, I guess, respect they have for someone who would have been married to Cal Drogo. Because uh, they're immediately like, oh, okay, all this joking has gone. Like, we're taking this serious now. So that was kind of cool to see a piece of their culture and how they value um, how they value her in that sense. Um, but I just, I, part of me felt like, eh, it was kind of easy, but it wasn't like that big a deal. I, I agree with you. I think they didn't want to spend much more time on that scene. So they were just like, man, eh, whatever, just, just, just go. There's a, there's a lot yeah. of shorthand going on in this episode yeah. and it's like hard to be, none of it's incorrect per se. It's a lot of shorthands for the sake of the plot. I mean, like you mentioned the tracking thing, which is totally fine. You've got this scene with, uh, you know, between the cow and, Amelia Clark, very shorthand, but that's fine. Like, we get the point. Okay, oh, he knows who she is, and here's the law. We don't touch them. It's so that we can get her onto her next storyline as opposed to drag it out further. And there's other storylines uh, later in the episode where we see some more, uh, kind of a similar thing happen, uh, partic- particularly with uh, with uh, Dorn. A lot of shorthand going on there. A lot. <laughs> Lots. She's going to be heading to this kind of home for widowed Khaleesi's, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm in the dark on this. Uh, just like the rest, of, we're all in the dark together on this. I really don't know where this is going. Do you think this is going to be a way for it's, her to kind of uh, to, going to be able to kind of re maybe to, to recruit, re recruit the Dothraki at all, or is this just kind of like she, a fun little side quest, a side venture? I I think she's going to struggle there. Um, I think you, she's going into a a city full of women that come from a warrior culture, and she is very much not a part of that. She's a ruler. She's a diplomat in a lot of ways. And I think it's even though she lived that life, she does understand them in, a, in some ways. She is still very much a foreigner in their society. And I think she's going to suffer for that a little bit. It, it definitely it puts her in a tough spot, because if she says, I'm not going to this home for widows, fuck yourself. Um, she's saying, I don't respect your culture, the culture that says you cannot claim me as your wife. Not to mention, you do not want to spit on Dothraki culture. I mean, they're not exactly known for mm-hmm. being diplomatic uh, or well-being at all. I, exactly. So you don't you don't want to risk doing that. And she's smart enough; she's going to have to ride it out. Uh, I I expect her to kind of play it kind of again, kind of lay low until she actually gets there and figures out what's going on. Um, if I had to guess. But your your point is really good. It, it would be very interesting if she ends up using this as another stepping stone, because as she has done in the past, at every opportunity. Um, she's been able to make the most of her situation in her environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, and if we're done talking about Daenerys for the week, let's go ahead and uh, touch on briefly touch on another very, again, very kind of brief check in, uh, uh, across the sea. And that just takes us back to Bravos. And, uh, we get our second Bernie Sanders shout out as Arya, the blind beggar is begging for money from the wealthy. Uh, Bernie Sanders, man, he's everywhere. Feeling the Game of Thrones, feeling the burn. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all the bankers and bravos, just uh, ignoring the poor folks. That's right. Got to redistribute that that uh, Iron Bank. We, uh, it's Wall we, Street. You know. Daniel Stoll, what did you make of this? I mean, your favorite character. Uh, she's blind. Uh, what, what did you think of the scene? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was just uh, another. Hey, let's. This is where her character is at. I mean, basically, I guess you could call it daredevil training, but. Uh, that's pretty much it. It's just a checking in with her. Hey, she's blind, and that's it. So, I mean, 
Uh, I, from the point of like she's been my favorite character, um, I was sad that there wasn't more, but I mean, it's just pretty straightforward. I think the two interesting things to note about this is one that she has not been abandoned. That she's very clearly still being trained and cared for um, by the faceless men. Um, and also someone on Reddit pointed out that if you pay attention to the talking going on in the background as she's listening, um, that there is talk about uh, uh, one of the people talk about the Kingsguard being killed. So that the Mirren Trant killing um, is still being talked about in the city and uh, might have potential repercussions still down the road. I, I definitely thought the exact same thing uh, Daniel said, uh, where we've got a little bit of Arya Matthew Murdoch uh, Stark going on here. Um, it definitely doesn't seem like her blindness is going anywhere. Um, and she's just going to have to learn to, uh, be a blind ninja, uh, in the way that Rucker Howard did in that fabulous film from the late eighties. Um, that I, <laughs> blind fury, uh, is a, it's a real movie. Uh, anyway, yes. uh, it definitely seems like her blindness isn't going anywhere and she's going to have to try to overcome that and become a, uh, assassin slash warrior regardless. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that mean Jacqueline Hagar is like her foggy? Is that what that means? I think that makes her uh, makes uh, him her stick, actually. Okay, well, appropriate. She needs a foggy though. Uh, silent girl who just picked on her foggy. There you go. Origin story done. <laughs> <laughs> now moving on to our favorite storyline of the week, and we're going to Dorn. Yay! Yeah. Do you remember that time when Ober Martell described Dorn, and we thought, man, that place sounds sick. That sounds sick as hell. It sounds like the place yeah. I'm on a vacation at. And we saw photos of Dorn, and you're like, oh my god, this is the most beautiful place ever. Let's go down to the beach, sip on the on the on the margarita with the sand and snakes. It, it could have been if Oberyn was there to guide us. Still, it could have been that for us, Caleb. It could have been. <laughs> well, uh, clearly his brother uh, Doran thought so too, because when he popped up in the scene, he's all like, man, Oberyn lived a life. He enjoyed all, of, he uh, experienced all of life to its fullest. Men, women, fights, yes. <laughs> Reminding us how awesome Oberyn was uh, right before he got stabbed in the chest because, oh my God, we have to kill him off somehow really fast, really fast. <laughs> it that literally made zero sense. That whole scene makes no sense. Alera um, is trying to get back at the Lannisters and start a war. She's trying to get back at the Lannisters for killing Martells by killing more Martells. It, right. it, it doesn't see, make any sense at all. See, I have the exact opposite opinion uh, where while the, the sense of the plot might be in question, I, I do think it's a really interesting plot development uh, because, I mean, it is a full-scale coup, uh, yes. which is something that is really interesting. I mean, we see a lot of rebellions uh, on this show. I don't think we've ever seen an actual coup which I think from you know an actual rebellion from within a half within a house, um, and unless you're going to count what's going on uh, up at the Night's Watch, the Red Wedding, yeah. Uh, but I do that's a good point. But I do think it's interesting that she's like, "Yep, uh, Dorn is not going to be under the boot hill of a Lannister ever again, uh, and you are not the person to keep that from happening." She she has no claim to the throne though. She's a bastard. None. Like, well, nothing. Yeah, none of them really do. And I guess, but the, now remind me, isn't Dorne the one that they value power and men and women? I think right. I was I was I was just about to say that Caleb uh, Dorne is kind of unique within the the Seven Kingdoms, where it is kind of uh, birthright is still important because they are under uh, the, the rule of the Seven Kingdoms. But I think in Dorne, what's more important is might makes right. Uh, if you can uh, fight for your claim, it's yours. Uh, so I, I definitely think that kind of shows part of what makes Dorne unique uh, is that, uh, yes, they respect birth lineage, uh, but it has much less importance than it does in the rest of Westeros. Yeah, that no, is I, really I, unfortunate because they, they are horrible characters. They are. Well, that's that's the problem. I feel like if they had done a better job setting this all up last season, it probably would have felt better. It just everything about it felt really forced. It's like, oh hey, we're in Dorne, and hey, it's a coup, and hey, somehow the Sand Snakes got to King's Lane to kill Tristane. We're not sure how that happened, but hey, we had to get it done. The job. Was, he, had yeah, to get done. was that in King's Landing? Yes. He remember yeah, he, he was on the boat with he went, Jamie. He went back to uh, Okay, so get this. Okay. Or okay. Behind yes. him or something. No, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> get this. Okay. So Jamie he go he they take Tristane back uh to King's Landing on the boat. First off, how is Tristane not a prisoner like immediately when they know Marcel is dead? And then yep. so he was just chilling on the boat by himself. How did the sand snakes get there? Did they like ride a boat right behind them? 
Like, how long had he been in King's Landing? Like, we just don't have any explanation. It was just a really, really fast, like, oh, God, we've got to get this plot moving. And, well, yeah, I, 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 I agree, Dalton, that the development's interesting. It's just the the, execu- the, the emotional investment in that storyline, for at least for me, it just isn't there. So it's hard for me to, like, yeah. really feel like – because I feel like this should be, like, a whole big, holy shit, I can't believe she just killed Doran Martell, the brother of her lover – uh, who is overseeing this kingdom? But it was just like, uh, oh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get this on. We gotta get this moving. We gotta kill this guy really, really fast so we can get them in power so that we can have a full scale war again. It yeah, it I was mean, a it was a mess of a storyline right there, a complete. Yeah, mess. I mean, to me, if I'm with you guys. It felt like, hey, it, the they were just like, hey, we screwed up last season, so we're gonna kill these characters and make something happen. And I mean, the because of what happened last season, I just. Didn't care about this storyline at all when it but happened. Like, I was just like, they, oh, okay. Yeah, they screwed up last season, but then they just compound it by screwing up this. <laughs> like, why not? I, I don't know. It, I Two wrongs don't make a right in, in this storyline, in my opinion. You, you guys definitely have a different perspective uh, on this as, as book readers because I know that Doran stuff in the book is, one, a lot different. Oh, and two, oh yeah. Lot, and two, sure. a lot more interesting. Uh, Austin, you, you're a show watcher only as well, right? Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, so me and Austin uh, don't have the appreciation for Dorn that you guys do other than uh, sexy Argentinian uh, George Clooney that is Oberon Martel. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a, a much different uh, – for, for the record, by the way, if our listeners are missing some Oberon in their lives, uh, Pablo Pascal uh, is a major character on Netflix's uh, series Narcos, if that interests you in the least. Um, he's still great on that show. Wish he was still on Game of Thrones. Fuck yourself, George R.R. Right. Martin. Um <laughs> But 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 Austin is right. Um, as much as I am interested in this plot development, it is hard. Uh, and Caleb, you mentioned this as well. It's hard to be emotionally invested in this because last season's side quest to Dorn was just signified nothing. I mean, in the recaps on for on the last season on Game of Thrones, they literally cover the Dorn stuff in maybe twenty seconds, and I was like, "Yep, that was pretty much everything that happened there." Uh, and it sucks because it was full of such potential, and I'm I'm hoping I. I, I can I definitely sympathize with uh, Austin's uh, reluctance on this plot development. I'm hoping it's it's going to be something interesting, just because of the, the grave that they dug for themselves in last season. I'm hoping they can get themselves out of it a little bit. Yeah, and I will say, like I I mean, as much as I hate how they're doing it, I do hope that the the pieces they're setting up are going to lead somewhere interesting and emotionally impactful. Um, in one way or another. So even though I don't like how we got to this point, I'm still open-minded. I'm still like, okay, well, maybe that they've gotten to these characters where they're over over Dorn now. Maybe maybe now something interesting can happen there. It's going to impact the characters we do care about. Uh, you know, and I, again, uh, Dalton, I'm glad you brought up the, the book reader versus show watcher. I don't dislike the storyline because it's not in the books, although that's also an irritation. I don't like it because I feel like it's just been poorly handled. From a, I feel like it's out of a totally different, significantly less... W- it's a less well constructed, well written, well acted, well presented show altogether. Yeah, we're we're not we're none too kind of Dorn, uh, but I, I I really feel like we got the elephant out of the room on this episode for me. <laughs> so let's move on to something that was significantly more interesting and better, uh, which is uh, speaking of Jamie back at King's Landing, and this is guys. Firstly, uh, hands uh, hats off to Lena Headey. And yep, Nikolai Coster Waldo for awesome, awesome acting, especially Lena Headey. This scene, you see yeah. no no dialogue. You see her go through this full range of emotions of sadness, excitement, uh, and anger, all within the context of about thirty seconds, all based purely off of facial expression. And oh, it's what awesome! A, it's such a great scene. I mean, really, yeah. just top notch acting, and reminds you. Um, if you had forgotten why uh, Lena Hetty is on this show, because I mean, if if you had forgotten since last year uh, the Walk of Shame, this this shot reminds you what she is about because she is a phenomenal performer, and I definitely think the MVP of the episode. Oh, hands down, the MVP of the episode. This is yeah. why she's still my favorite character. Austin, I will say this. Uh, we hit on this uh, at the end of uh, last season when we were talking about how the Walk of Shame did this thing where, you know, she had it coming to her, quote unquote. But then when you see it, Game of Thrones is this thing where you, they build up all this hatred and anger you have at this character. And then when they get their just desserts, you're watching, and you're like, oh my God, they don't deserve this. This is terrible. No human being deserves to. Like with Theon. And, yes. Yep. Theon. Well, even and, Joffrey to some extent. Yeah. I mean, 
The, I didn't feel shit. that way for that one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my, my point is, though, that Caleb is right. Yeah. The, the show, uh, every time it gives you what you want, it subverts your expectations, which I think is part of what makes it such an interesting show. Because even when Joffrey dies, it is long, it is unpleasant to watch, and same with The Walk of Shame last season. Uh, if anything, it galvanizes the viewer's support for Cersei because I mean, she is accosted and assaulted by the uh, entirety of King's Landing, and it makes you really want her to fuck up Jonathan Price. Oh, God. Uh, for, yeah. Because you, you're just hoping that uh, that Franken Mountain uh, just throws him off of a building because you, you were so galvanized with support for her. Yes, she's mean. Yes, she is incestuous. Yes, she puts herself before others. But you know what? She loves her children. Um, and everything she has done uh, in her own weird way is out of love for her children. So to see her degraded like that at the end of last season, um, the, the speech that uh, she gets from Jamie and in really that scene they share together, I, I think is really powerful for me at least. Yeah, I, I, you guys touched on it. I think she did an amazing job. I mean, I think this is by far, for me, the best scene of the whole premiere. And she, and especially when she starts talking about how she actually kind of acknowledges maybe a smidge of guilt and a regret in some sense, you know, as she talks about uh, her daughter, and she says, you know, how if I how, if I made something so good, maybe I'm not a monster, and you know, it's really really powerful to see her talk about that, and she just, uh, Lena Hayes just does a great job with that. Yeah, it hits so, her core, I, and and I I think what I like about it is, you know, I I I think Cersei Lannister is a fantastic, wonderful, beautiful beautifully created character i don't like her i now feel like i'm on her side i am now on her and yeah. jamie's side i'm rooting for them to go take down uh you know the the martells and to go uh take out jonathan price and the rest of the you know religious zealots and and who's gonna help her caleb well now you mention it we did have uh the franklin clegane uh was standing there he was there's there that there's that but um i think she's going to find a newfound friend in marjorie tyrell Ooh, they have a. They really? now have a common enemy. I think the Tyrells mm. and Lannisters will team up once again to uh, to crush the old uh, the sparrows, huh? Sparrows. Yep, I believe so. Interesting. You know, I did. I hadn't even considered that, but that would be you know unite them against a common enemy before they go out and try to kill each other again. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the question about that scene: uh, Is you come back to this the, the the idea that was presented a couple seasons ago uh, when? Stannis and uh, Melisandre burned the slugs, and you know, to to kill the false kings, and two of the three of them died pretty soon a- soon afterwards. Now, is Cersei did her children die because of the prophecy, or is that just happenstance? You know, that's really the big question on my mind here because she blames it on the prophecy, and then of course Jamie says, "Fuck prophecy," uh, you know, fuck yeah. the, the, the house things, you know. Um, so I, I just, it, 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 I love how Game of Thrones is still wrestling with those themes of like, huh, what is prophecy? Are we, are prophecies meant to be self-fulfilling or are they, do they have actually have magical and a magical element to them? Uh, and that so was, I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting point of conversation that she brought that up though. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, we, I don't think we've ever heard her actually speak about the prophecy out loud to anyone. I mean, obviously we saw it, um, last season, but I don't think she's ever mentioned it to anyone. So it was kind of interesting to see her i mean she did just come from one of her lowest points ever so that's really started to change kind of maybe the way she thinks or her mentality so mm-hmm. i think we're starting to see how that really has impacted her what 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 she's gone through yeah um also though i, I think uh to, to kind of cap off the uh king's landing situation uh conversation though i seeing I was curious as to why they put that Marjorie scene there other than to establish that Marjorie was still around. But I think you raise a good point. Her Mm -hmm. and Cersei have both shared a really miserable experience under the Sparrows. And we see that, uh, you know, a high high Sparrow, Jonathan Price, has no intention of letting Marjorie off easy in this scene. So if we thought maybe he was actually going to go easier on her for uh, lying under oath, then we were wrong. Uh, so seeing the Martells team up with the, the Lannisters, I, that could be a thing. You know, I hadn't even considered that. That's a really great idea. Well, that takes us to our final destinations in the north. Uh, heading north, uh, back all the way up to, we're saving the best for last. So that means we're going for just to Winterfell. So, uh, yeah. So guys, guess what? Uh, Sansa and Theon slash Reek, uh, whoever he claims to be or is, 
they sur- not only did they not only did they survive, they are running very well. They're they're pretty much fine. unscathed from like a forty foot fall. Oh, at least, but you know, it's because that snow it was it was right. puffy, it was flowery. You know, I figured they'd at least have like a broken leg or something, but nah. Well, it's funny because you know they they fell the they fell the same height as uh, Miranda, who died brutally. Now, granted, she they landed in snow and she landed on pavement, but still, it just was kind of funny. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you know what? Those uh, the snow drifts they'll they'll do you a big favor. It turns yeah. out <laughs> apparently Westerosi snow drifts equal uh, magic. Um, the softest, but- most powdery snow in all of Westeros. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, when I was talking about short, shortcuts earlier, that was kind of what I was at here. And again, it's not like a, it's not a problem. Like, it's not. It's just one of those. It's like, again, TV logic. You're like, OK. They right. should, they it, just, no, those a, it is. Uh, I'll put this way. The end of the, the final episode of last season had so many atrocities into it for, like, cutting to black. It was ridiculous. So all the problems that I'm currently having with this current episode are the result of uh, last season's final episode sucking in a lot of areas. Well, I just with cl- how it handled the cliffhangers. Yeah, it was really bad, really bad with that stuff. They're on the run, uh, so they did. They did get away. Uh, they they crossed the river. Uh, Theon is now leading Sansa, and there's something really cool uh, about this about this scene. And again, there's a lot of Theon haters out there, and for not not uh, for uh, for reasonable the the reasonable hatred. I I, I don't hate him, um, but it was really cool to see him protecting Sansa in kind of the same way he used to look after Rob, and he, and he was kind of serving as this kind of you know um, subservient like protector in a sort of way that I thought was really really cool and really really powerful. And I was like, oh, this is Starks and. Theon back helping the Starks again it was really really cool. So he tries to it, it was really touching when he tried to hide her and he was gonna like go sacrifice himself for her. That was awesome. He's like, yeah, you stay here. I'm gonna go lie to cover you and you know whatever. And of course he didn't. He he rolled he rolled a one on his uh on his bluff check. So unfortunately <laughs> it was a total fail. It was it was like a three. A one would have been like, hey, she's right there. <laughs> but uh, it was like a three. <laughs> It was uh, <laughs> definitely within the ballpark of a critical failure. Um, <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, that, but I'm I'm with Caleb, man. You know, Theon Greyjoy is dead, but but Reek is kind of taking back his his humanity uh, in in a way that I found pretty touching. So I, I was happy to see things play out the way they did in that scene, um, even before the the awesome rescue of uh, from Brienne and Podrick. Um, but yeah, that. That stuff where where Reek's like, just stay here, be quiet. I'm gonna try to get rid of them. At, uh, it was really kind of powerful stuff, and uh, I forget his the actor's name. Uh, but say what you will about the character Theon Greyjoy, the acting is is, is top notch from him. It really is. So yeah, Alfie Allen is killing. You know, I, I would agree with that sentiment that Alfie Allen is probably one of the best actors on the show. He's Despite being tortured for an entire season, I do feel like he has had some of the more challenging material. And I said this way back when we started this podcast, and a room full of haters, what he's done is wrong, but I really do feel this like Shakespearean vibe going on with this character's arc, where he's trying, you know, and trying to win back his father's love. He sacrifices his actual family, and it's brought on this really, really just oh god depressing bleak and almost painful to watch but uh redemptive arc where he's hit rock bottom and now he's he's making a comeback he's he's actually like you said regaining humanity and regaining uh his autonomy and it's just something it's really really great to see and it's really exciting um, here's uh, here's a thought um i i don't know you this might be kind of swinging for the fences here but um They've talked about in this scene heading north, right, up to the wall to go see Jon Snow. Obviously, we know Jon Snow is currently dead. Currently. We know that Melisandre has been able to do kind of miraculous things with King's Blood in the past. What if Theon sacrifices himself? He does have King's Blood. He's the son of, of the, uh, the king of, the, of House Greyjoy. I mean, he's one of the five kings, the only one left standing for the record. Um and maybe that could be his final act of redemption. He finally, he sacrifices himself, brings back Jon Snow, um, and kind of ultimately redeems himself for all the damage he's caused. 
That would be interesting. Um, you know, I I can't say that's wrong. I I feel like he's meant more more for more than just that, just to sacrifice himself to bring John Snow back. But at the same time, that would be kind of fitting because you know he he took us in, in a roundabout way. He took a Stark's life, or uh, you know, by failing Rob, and it would be a good way for him to kind of pay that back, I guess, for, to John. Maybe uh, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I, I don't I don't know if that's where it's going to go, but I think that's that's uh, worth considering. We've got the return of Brienne, who somehow, uh, again, TV logic, again, lots of fun, knew that Sansa and Theon were over there. Uh, maybe they heard the dogs, probably, I'd imagine. So they just knew how to, when to show up. But they show up. There's a really, really cool fight. They duke it out. Theon, Podrick saves Podrick. Uh, you know, in the same way that Podrick saved uh, Tyrion. Tyrion at the Battle of the Blackwater. That was kind of cool. Uh, yep. But yeah, no, there was, uh, and, and I, I think, yeah, I, I think there was this really cool scene bet- between Brienne and Sansa, right? Yeah, I mean, you, this is the first time, at least for me, that Sansa's really starting to take control of her life. Now, we started to see her kind of become a bigger player with the whole little finger thing, but it never really panned out in the way that I thought it, w- thought it would. She ended up being with Ramsay, and then all these terrible things happened to her again. So this is the first time where finally she's taking control of her life. She's knighting Brienne as her, as her knight that's going to be... Um, the one that guards her, and, I, and it felt like to me like she's going to be the one that deciding where that little group goes. I mean, I'm sure she'll take advice from Brienne, but it seems like she's sort of the the leader of that group to me. Um, so that was really cool, and I'm really excited to see what they're going to do with her character as she's finally. It seems like she's finally hit the point where she's going to be in control of her own life, and she's not just being controlled by other people or tortured by a Ramsay or a Joffrey. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Stoll. I think you're I think you're dead on. I think you're dead on. Uh, for the first time, she it's a beautiful kind of marriage because Sansa has been fighting for her independence in a roundabout way and, and just c- continuously squandered by the society and the world's built for her, uh, whether it was through Joffrey, whether it was through Ramsay, even Littlefinger, who showed her a lot more affection and care, was still using her as a pawn. Uh, he, she was still listening. He was still pulling the strings with her. And now she's the one calling the shots. And it's beautiful because you have Brienne who has wanted nothing more than to protect Sansa. So there's this kind of, there's a marriage I have an idea there. You've got this protector who, who was looking for someone to protect. And this, and this lady who has been struggling for independence, who is going to find herself now as kind of leader of her own little group here. Uh, and that's something I that's really really cool. And that's uh, we're talking about like em- empowered ladies on the show. I mean, this is beautiful. You have Sansa Stark, who a lot of people have given shit for over this entire series, like unrightfully so because they're stupid um, about being you know kind of a whiny girl. And you know she is now coming into her own. Uh, and you have Brienne, who is probably like the most badass woman on the show, arguably, um, who is is now uh, they're going to be joining forces together uh, and leading the men around, which is super cool and something you don't see in fantasy like ever. Uh, and it's just is it super super exciting, and that this is when Game of Thrones is doing something really interesting and cool on its own that you don't you're not going to see elsewhere on TV. Uh, I, I at least I don't think so. She she is now I think at the point where I can like truly respect her because she's finally had the courage to reject her situation, rise up against the people who've been uh, torturing her. Um, and try to take control of her life, exactly what Stahl was saying. Um, and that's really exciting. It is. But I think giving her shit up until this point was valid. I want to touch on something Caleb mentioned, which is uh, one of the things that I love about this whole segment is the, the character moment for Brienne um, is, is that she gets what she has been dying for since Caitlin Stark died, which is that she finally has someone to serve she gets to feel like a real knight finally which is all she's ever wanted and there's this great moment where Sansa um, who has trained all of her life to to be a a lady in the court has forgotten how to accept fealty from a knight and Padra Castra to to like help her along and it's this great scene where these these three characters come together and kind of very quickly form a a new family unit where, where Podrick is like hey hey this, this is how it's done. I, I know you're wanting to do it the, the quote, proper way, and I, I want, just want to make help you do that. And, and she kind of accepts that help uh, because she wants she wants Brienne to feel like a real knight, and that's all Brienne has ever wanted. So it really is kind of a touching moment between those three characters. Um, and, and I think Austin makes a great point uh, about Sansa throughout this entire series has tried to operate within the society that she was born into and has tr- tried to be a, a good lady of the court and has finally said, well, that shit is not going to work. 
um, because she's a Stark. And to, to a fault, Starks are good people. Uh, they, they believe in uh, humanity and, and humanism and treating people like uh, people and not objects. Uh, and in, in Westeros, that's often a good way to get yourself killed. Uh, and she's finally realized that she could be true to herself, um, but that's not going to mean operating within the system. I, I guess this means that uh, Stannis is dead, though. Did we, did we actually – was there actual verbal compliment information or did I miss it? Uh, yeah, he's, he's dead as fucking fried chicken. Um, yeah, because because Roos Bolton says uh, to Ramsey, "Hey, did we ever find out who killed Stannis?" So they found his body. Okay. Dude is yeah. dead. God damn it! <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't think they were gonna do that. I because I, I was hoping they wouldn't. Because I thought it was a pretty like awful. It wasn't quite an off screen death, but the the cut to black was kind of stupid. We, well, we don't even see his body. I mean, every other major Game of Thrones character you see their body like the next episode. That's uh, I I'm sorry. Like that's just, they'd have to pay him for another season. Well, <laughs> another episode. I, here's, I guess my point is like I I don't like. I'm not a big Stannis fan. I'm really not. But God, that guy deserves our time to like for us to mourn the fact that this dude died. Or he did awful things. I know it's he's worth mourning for, I guess. Not a good person. I think but what I he did was in his own twisted world was kind of noble and again more Shakespearean. Uh I think we tragedy got like there. two episodes. I, I think we got like two episodes of a funeral for Stannis. And that was starting with him marching across the snow, trying to attack Winterfell. Like all of that was one giant death scene. I wanted to I, I, I agree with Austin and I kind of want to defend that choice dramatically. Um, a lot of the times when we see people die on, on Game of Thrones, it is very graphic. But if you think about the death of Ned Stark, that also happens a little bit off camera. I mean, yes, we see his head leave his body, but it is kind of from a wide shot. Um, and I think what the show was trying to do is kind of preserve his dignity in that moment because he does accept his fate um, like, a, like a, a true warrior. He says, do your duty. He, he doesn't argue with what she has to say. He knows she's right. Uh, and I think at this point he he realizes that. And I, again, I think it, when he chooses to lead last season, when he chose to lead the the foolhardy attack on Winterfell, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to die, um, but he knew that he had no other uh, course the, of action. The only issue I had with it, yes, Ned, it did happen to Ned. However, there was another episode left in the season. Well, that, and that's a good. And you also saw that, his head. You saw his head the next episode, like literally the next shot of the, was the executor uh, holding the head up. You know, so I and I I'd say that's a fair point. But but I dramatically uh, I rewatched the last mm-hmm. episode of season five before season six. And it's pretty clear. I mean, there's a thwack sound. It doesn't just cut to black. I mean, there is the sound of a sword hitting a human being. Yeah, uh, you're right. So, so I think that I think what what our our showrunners were trying to do here is give him a moment of dignity, not make it a graphic, you know, kind of viscerally pleasing moment, and and really make it a, a moment about the drama more than the visceral thrills. Yeah, no, that's I, I I appreciate that because most of the characters who die, even characters we love like Ober Martell, I mean, God, that character we love, and he got, I mean, just just ravaged uh, in his death, and and yeah, Stannis didn't have to. We don't have to remember Stannis that way. Uh, we did remember him for burning his daughter, I guess. But anyway, I, it's just a point. It's, it's it was an interesting choice, and and I don't know. Maybe I'll come around to it. Maybe I because I think yeah, Dalton, that's a really good point. Uh, it does it does in a way set him a. a Sep- separates him from most of the major characters on Game of Thrones because we didn't see it. So worth considering. It just, it just, I think worth a, a point worth uh, talking about. But uh, maybe I don't know. It might grow on me eventually. But you know, we're going to mention Roos and Ramsey. We did get a very brief scene between the two of them. I, I don't really feel like it really added much to we didn't what we didn't already know. Uh, basically, Roos is all like, "Yo, man, why did you lose the most important thing we had going on here? And you treated her like crap. So of course she's going to run away, and you let her slip through your fingers. And that's pretty much. The, and then he threatens to say, "Well." Well, if Walda gives me a baby, maybe I'll let him be the heir. You know, that's, that's I mean, about all I get from a scene. They, I mean, they did have a very, very brief moment where Ramsey was actually showing some human emotion, and then he kind of like ruined it with saying, "Oh, like he gave this kind of like really nice speech about how he cared about Miranda." I think her name was who had who had died, and then she's like, and throw her to the dogs. So like he had this really small moment of human emotion, and uh. it was gone. I think those can exist within the same. I mean, he's obviously extremely nihilist, but he did really feel true emotion. There. Yeah, yeah, no, he did. I'm not saying that it, that it was gone, gone. It was just like interesting. Like mm-hmm. there's like this mid, like 30 seconds of emotion, then it's back to practical Ramsey who 
is not emotion. You know, he, yeah. it was uh, it, he took that amount of time to be emotion, have emotion, and then it was move on. Yep, it's that easy for him because he's a yeah. sociopath. <laughs> And I, I really do feel like this sets the precedent. I know we and Stoll had a disagreement last week, and I'm going to push this even harder. I really think this is the, the end of the line for these guys. Dalton, I, I want to get your take. If you had any opinion on the Boltons at all this season, I really feel like this is the season they're going to meet their maker. Just from, from for a lot of reasons, from from a story standing, uh, from a story standpoint, uh, like from a storytelling standpoint, from the outside looking in, like oh, well, what left do these characters have left to do? And then secondly. Also, like I, the, they're they've kind of flat the characters themselves in the context of their own storyline have have kind of settled in a little too too contently into Winterfell. Well, there there is this great moment where where Roose reminds Ramsay just how highly he rates. Where he he's like, "Do you feel like a winner? Do you really feel like a winner? Well, uh, good. Th- I, I I hope uh, my my Frey wife is having a boy, um, or rather, I should say, I hope you should hope." that my Frey wife isn't having a boy because then I will have a legitimate heir uh, and you can fuck right off. Uh, so it, it really is this kind of heartbreaking is not the right word, but it's the first word that comes to mind because, you know, we all hate Ramsey and Roose Bolton, uh, but Ramsey does kind of have a moment where he's put in check and he has to think about what his actual role is as a bastard in this world. Like, no, it doesn't matter that you've been granted legitimacy, that you've been named Ramsey Bolton. If I get a legitimate male heir, you're right the fuck out, especially if you can't give me results. Um, and the fact that you chased off the one claim we had to the North, which was Sansa Stark, by the fact that you're a manipulative, sadistic rapist, the fact that you couldn't keep it in your pants, for lack of a better way to phrase it, means that we're going to lose the North. I don't give a shit. I'll have my, my new boy son, and uh, you're done. So it is kind of an interesting moment just in terms of their relationship. But yeah, it, things have kind of run the, their course with those two characters, and I think we're all waiting for them to die. Uh, I heard an uh, interesting fan... Th- oh, go ahead, Austin. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I I think it's less the end... If that happens, it's less the end for Ramsey and more the end for Roos, because I think Ramsey will murder them. That is a very good point, and I, I think that is not beyond Ramsey, because... He does love yeah. him some stabbing people. Um, I, I mean, I think I, I, I agree with that. I think Ramsey, like the death, I think Ramsey will kill Roos. Like, I think that's how Roos's line will end. I think Ramsey will just decide that, you know, he, he doesn't want to wait for the boy. He's going to just kill him himself. Now, I, I want to bring up in, in this moment, uh, since we're talking about the ultimate fate of the Boltons, an interesting fan theory that I heard. Uh, obviously, this is not a spoiler because we are officially uh, surpassing the books in terms of timeline. All speculation. But an interesting fan theory I heard. Uh, all speculation at this point. Um, Jon Snow, obviously, is probably going to come back from the dead. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, the idea at this point being that if uh, Jon Snow is revived, he's officially fulfilled his debt to the Night's Watch because a, a brother's oath is only until death. And since he's dead, his oath is fulfilled uh, and the current prevailing fan theory is that the the big battle scene that was teased by the showrunners during production is Jon Snow leading the Bannermen of the North against the Boltons at, at Winterfell and that he's just going to murder the shit out of everybody. So I don't – obviously that's completely speculation, but I think it would be interesting dramatically. Um, and, and the Boltons have run their course and it's time for them to, to be uh, shuffling off this mortal coil. Speaking of Jon Snow, guys, it's time to get to the meat and the potatoes of the episode here, and that is The Wall. First shot of the episode, saved it for last. Really, really cool long take as we zoom back in right where we left Jon Snow last season, lying there in blood on the ground. And uh, guys, just want you to create – Benioff and Weiss really want you to know, in case you had any doubts at all, this guy is dead. D-E-D. He's dead. (laughs) Uh, So – I I agree. This man, right at this moment, at this point in time, is definitely a dead body. There's not a living being in that vessel. Uh, so we get him. He's, but I think it's very, for, for a lot of reasons, it's interesting that they went out of their way to move the body <laughs> into yeah. that room so that it was preserved. Why would they do and that? protect it. it protect it. Correct. What are you talking about, Caleb? They do that with every character who dies in the show i mean look at stannis come on i mean they, at, at the wall they they're not used to burning bodies immediately so they don't come back to life yeah 
Not that, uh, not that Jon Snow could burn anyway, because we all know what's going on there. <laughs> oh, God, you have no idea. So, guys, I really hope this is how we find out Jon Snow comes back from the dead. Everyone thinks Melisandre is going to do it, and I'm sure that would be really cool, too. But he what rises if it's from the fire like Danny? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You have no uh, idea how yes. bad I want to see oh, that happen. Yeah. And his hair is That'd still perfectly, so cool. and his hair is still perfectly intact. And his mouth is still <laughs> perfectly open. Mm, and his lips are still perfectly luscious. My very, uh, my very good friend Kirsten Thurkelson, who writes for Good Trash Media and our, uh, her under her uh, Frightful Thim blog, uh, pointed out that even in death, Jon Snow cannot close his fucking mouth. <laughs> Correct. Correct. He's still his mouth is still his mouth is still hanging open there. Oh god. But Austin's right. When you've got those luscious pouty lips, exactly. your mouth just isn't gonna close. It can't it can't help it. It's just when, it's like when, when you have the when you have the abs that Kit Harrington has, you need a lot of oxygen coming into your body. <laughs> <laughs> now does does Davos know Sanus is dead at this point? Did he? Did that get revealed? It did. Melisandre told him. Melisandre yeah. implied yeah. it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she said they lost. You know, they failed. Basically, you know, and I, I was wrong about everything. You know, so he definitely gets the idea that that did not go well. Yeah. Well, so he I, definitely knows at this point. He's a man without a king. I was gonna say the exact same thing, uh, Austin. Uh, at this point, Davos has no one to serve. So really, what he's falling back on is what he thinks is right. Um, he doesn't know what is coming, but he listens to Jon Snow and believes him. Um, I don't know if we actually got a scene of, of Davos and Jon Snow talking about the White Walkers. I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, but it definitely seems like that Davos believes Jon Snow at his word. Uh, and he knows, number one, there are worse things coming. And number two, uh, you don't fucking kill the person that's leading you. Uh, that's just not the way things are done. So he, he, he at this point... As Austin said, he has no king, so he is really just acting in the interest of what he thinks is right. Yeah, and it is the moment where he, he really gets to shine. We've seen him sub. I mean, obviously Davos has been a fan favorite for a long time, so I do not want to sh- uh, sell him short whatsoever, um, because he's always had really brilliant things to say. I mean, he really redeemed Stannis consistently through that entire storyline over and over and over again. So I'm not trying to sell him short, but what's really interesting here is we see him acting on his own accord without Stannis. He's not trying to convince people to serve Stannis anymore because there's no more Stannis to serve. So he's kind of this man without a banner in a way, and he's kind of putting it behind Jon Snow, even though Jon Snow's dead, maybe behind the cause at least, at least in this particular instance. What I thought was really interesting was that he even mentions Melisandre. He's like, Hey, you haven't seen what Melisandre can do, and like he's almost like he's kind of been against her this whole time, and now all of a sudden he's, you know, calling for her aid. Almost, I thought that was really kind of interesting. Um, but the, you know, like you guys are pointing out, he doesn't have a king anymore, and so he's just doing what he feels is right. And if he's willing to use Melisandre as a way to do what he feels is the right thing to do, I, I think so. The uh, the Onion Knight is 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 coming around in. Uh Again, I think he's going to have some really cool because he's not understanding his banner any longer. I think he's going to have some real interesting stuff to do. I at least I hope so. And God, if those freaking Night's Watchmen kill him, oh God, ugh. Okay. Well, we got this great tease during uh, the trailers for season six that show uh, Davos uh, drawing his sword on some members of the Night's Watch. So this conflict is going to come to a head. Um, and uh, Davos, being the complete and utter badass that he is, I suspect that he will prevail. I expect so. So uh, we're gonna mark how many episodes are we gonna have the uh, great uh, the great uh, siege of room two thirty seven at the wall. <laughs> I was gonna call it uh, the uh, the Waco Texas of the Black Wall, uh, <laughs> but of the, of the Black Watch. But that works even better, Daniel. Thank you, and Daniel and Caleb. <laughs> uh, yeah. So now we also got to see how uh, Thorn, Alistair Thorn, just pretty much took again. Very shorthand, but still effective. Uh, it just takes I, control of the Night's Watch. He, he's just all like, they're all like, oh my god, someone killed the man we elected as our leader. Who killed him? Who killed him? I did, and you can suck it. That's basically what happened. Oh, okay. I, I, I actually, I don't think we can just chop this up to, you know, try, I know that that's what they're trying to do is just move fast, but I actually really struggled with this. You know, they're all. I think even someone says, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'll kill the man who killed Jon Snow or something uh, along those lines. And then, uh, you know, as you, they just once he says, hey, I killed him and I followed every single command. So 
Um, that makes me a loyal person. Like, and then they're like, oh, okay, we're not going to do anything now, except for like, you know, the five people in the room. I'm with I just, Daniel. I That's really a- don't like how I just feel like I know they're trying to just move it on and all that stuff, but I feel like this was just weak, and I feel like they could have done more here. Yeah, I'm with Daniel. That is a really odd moment dramatically where you have uh, a room that is probably at least 50% Jon Snow supporters, if not more. Uh, and as soon as Alistair gives his reasons for committing a treason, they're like, oh, well, oh, okay, I guess that's a pretty good reason. Uh, and they just move on with the scene. And, and it is kind of a weird moment dramatically. I, I feel a little differently about it, but only because the parallels between this and Julius Caesar are so striking. Like, oh, it really is are. dead fucking on. Um, whereas, yeah, Alistair Thorne is Brutus. He's absolutely yeah. 100% Brutus. Oh, I was going to say Ollie's Brutus in this equation, but... Uh, that could be, yeah. The parallels to Julius Caesar, I think, are really striking. Obviously, they're they're very much referencing that kind of historical event, um, as they've done with the other events in the past. Red Wedding has historical um, kind of references and stuff in it. Um, so... While I agree with you, it seemed kind of silly from a dramatic standpoint. Or just like, oh, okay. I did appreciate it from a like a historical and even Shakespearean standpoint. And I'd say that's fair um, because the the way the scene uh, where Jon Snow was stabbed is beautifully shot and does reference Julius Caesar in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I guess for me, and I'm going to speak for Daniel here. I, I guess for us, it, it does kind of feel like a very quick uh, resolution. But I, you know, I am inter- I'm interested in the momentum of plot here uh, because there's a lot of ground to cover in this first episode, and I think there are more interesting stories to tell. So while I am with Daniel, uh, I think it's a good point, Austin, uh, about those historical parallels because, yeah, um, <laughs> the assassination of Julius Caesar, uh, both historically and in the Shakespearean play, uh, are, are both kind of very quickly resolved. Everyone's was really fell in line very quickly when they heard uh, the reasonings uh, between uh, the reasonings of the conspirators. So uh, while I while I get what Austin's going for, and while I agree to it to some extent, I am definitely in your camp, Daniel. That I I, I just feel it's a little wonky in, in terms of the way they they chose to resolve that particular conflict. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of on the line of it. I I, I mean I, I I do appreciate the Shakespearean parallels there, Austin. And I'm not quite convinced that this is over either, guys. I mean, we, this is just episode one. I. I, I did one thing we we should probably mention is that Ed, you know that character you probably whose name you probably didn't know but you vaguely recognized, uh, is was sent away by Davos uh, to go and find others who owe their lines to Jon Snow. It's like I don't know, maybe other Night's Watchmen or hey, maybe uh, how about that you know entire army of wildlings he saved from Hardhome, yep. uh, you know. So, oh yeah, it's it's yeah. definitely um, the wildlings and their dope ass giant. Oh god, yeah, they're gonna have the giant. Oh god, I just rewatched Hard Home, and that giant is such a badass. Oh my god, yeah, no, I think we're gonna see them come back. I, I so I don't feel like this conflict's over, and even though the the snow supporters were silenced pretty quickly and you know almost too easily, I don't think this is over. I I would I would be surprised if we didn't revisit this conflict, the split, and the Night's Watch in the next couple episodes, actually. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I'm pretty in the middle of it. I was like, okay, well, that seems kind of fast, but hey, if it, if it gets a plot moving along, as long as they, as long as they acknowledge it being a difficulty in the future episodes, I think I can roll with it. Um, now let's go ahead and close out on the tiltular scene of the episode, uh, the red woman. And uh, we get uh, a scene where we find out that Melisandre is not exactly as she appears to be, uh, as Daniel st- uh, noted at the top of the episode, she is apparently a walking Instagram filter with her red necklace uh, <laughs> destiny there. I think this is really showcasing her character in doubt. She she believed in Stannis and and he died and let her down. And then she apparently had visions of Jon Snow leading in an attack on Winterfell. Hmm. Uh, leading an attack on Winterfell and now he's dead. So I really feel like she's she's struggling to to believe in R- Rolar and his uh, his powers, even though by and large, a lot of times she's been right. Yeah, I think that also we talked about, you know, how there's a lot of women in this episode. I also think there's definitely a theme of brokenness or despair in this episode. I mean, if you think about it, we got uh, Melisandre, who's probably at her lowest point, seems to be at her lowest point ever. Um, Danny being captured, Arya being blind, Davos and the group of men to an extent, like they're backed into this room with uh, Cersei, you know, defending Jon Snow, Cersei. Yeah. Um, all these characters are at like a really low point in their life uh, as well. Um, 
So I think that's what we're seeing here is just her questioning her faith at this point and whether or not um, she wants to continue serving the Lord of Light. What we're seeing here is is her really kind of stripping off the layers that have made her um, what she has shown people. I mean, her her robes, her necklace, and then her youth itself. Um, it's, it is interesting, though, you bring up the potion, though. Um, you have that little clear bottle, which is the one specifically that she told Celise not to touch. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know what it is. I don't know if that is something that um, she drinks in order to maintain her youth potentially, or maybe it's one that she's own that she's had been reserving for something special. I thought maybe my initial thoughts, and apparently no one else thought this, that she was she drank it and she was basically trying to give up her life to save Jon Snow because. At this point, I'm just like trying to look for anything that's saving Jon Snow. Um, but I, think, I, I think I'm a, I think I'm alone on my own little island on that theory. Oh, well, I think my take for the Jon Snow thing is if you think about this, um, let me see, make sure I get the names right. Um, when uh, the Lord of what, we've met a uh, priest before, both Beric Dondarrion and, and Thoros. If you guys remember, uh, Thoros is the priest um, or the one that serves the Lord of Light. Uh, he says. Uh, that he was at his lowest point and then he loses his dear friend Dondarrion. And at that moment, that's when the Lord of Light granted him the ability to bring people back from the dead. And, and it was an accident. Um, and notice it was an accident. Yeah. Like he did not ask for that power. It just kind of happened. Right. But, and it's, and it's in that moment of his lowest point where he doesn't, he is when that occurs. And so I think that is a big callback to this scene also is a callback to that as a parallel. She's now at her lowest point. Maybe the Lord of Light is going to do something about that now. And I think Daniel makes a great point, um, not just you know in terms of the plot, uh, but as well as dramatically um, and emotionally. And Daniel touched on this as well. Um, we are getting to finally see Melisandre, and and we've seen shades of this at the end of uh, season five, but we're getting to see Melisandre really having serious doubts in the Lord of Light. And I think, other than again giving us some plot intrigue. That's what this scene does really effectively is show us this character who's kind of a, a, a zealot in terms of, you know, how she approaches her faith. We're, we're seeing her really have these moments of doubt uh, about whether or not she's been right all this time. And when you say all this time, we're talking apparently, according to um, um, Benny Hoff and Weiss, centuries. thousands of years. Oh, yeah. If not thousands of years. Yeah. So it's been a, a this is a belief structure that she has built um, over a very, very long period of time, and it's taken losing losing Stannis and probably Jon Snow too, because I think she very much was interested in, in what he had going on um, to to kind of break her um, at this point. And she does very, very much look broken. Another, by the way, fantastic performance. Um, uh, I think it just very short, all facial expressions, but just mm-hmm. a very, very good performance by. Um, what was her name? Cl- Clarice Hooten? Hooten, I Hooten, think your name Hooten, is. Yeah, yeah, Clarice yeah. Hooten. Um, yeah, no, I I agree with you guys. I thought that again, uh, phenomenal acting uh, from that actress, and and it's just really again humanizing a character that we generally don't like. We don't generally trust. We don't really trust her because we don't know a lot about her. But man, she has really been selling. She really sold it in this episode without really, really just one, maybe two scenes she had. It just totally blew it out of the water. Uh, now, mm-hmm. now, something I want to ask you guys about, and again, um, I, I I'm interested to hear kind of what the deal is. Uh, I've what did we did we think that the uh, the nudity uh, the use of nudity in this final scene was appropriate uh, with uh, you know kind of the you know showing her naked and youthful? Uh, did you feel like it was being uh, effective and, and having something to say, or do you think it was like oh shit we got to the end of the script and we and we realized we didn't have enough boobs in in this episode so we have to meet our quota. I didn't. I didn't feel like it was gratuitous in any way, really. Um, I, I thought it was important, as I said before, in in showing the kind of the stripping of the layers and stuff, everything that she's put on, all the smoke and mirrors that she's put up, as Daniel referenced. Um, and I think it was important in that way to kind of illustrate that very uh, graphic. Yes, but I think it was effective. Yeah, I definitely agree with Austin. I don't see this as – I don't have a problem with this at all. I think it was very, very effective to see what she's put – like you see her, what she's showing people. And then as 
uh, Austin said, you taking off the layers and showing her what she re- where she really is and who she really is right now. Um, so, so yeah, I thought it was very effective. So you think that we were using you know, again uh, this? You see this vol- uh, voluptuous beauty. You know, uh, of course, she's always been she's very often been used as kind of a uh, as an object of sex in the show because she produces you know smoke babies and. Uh, smoke babies and you know it has been a sign of like temptation to a lot of characters and we see that that's all just a guy's uh, a fraud and that she's taking that away so you think that was so that you think that was why it was necessary to show kind of like the the naked melisandre in that scene i believe so yes okay yeah, i would agree with that there is a the, the the camera does linger there for a while and and I you know I've gotten to the point with Game of Thrones it's, it's a thing I, I I am all I'm constantly going back and forth and I'm like dude mm-hmm. Game of Thrones in this episode especially God help women empowered women yes like we mentioned at the top of the episode almost every single major plot line you have the stuff between Bra- uh, Brienne and Sansa earlier in the episode but then you have the scene where you have a very you know gazy kind of camera but I think you're right I actually agree with you guys I think you're right I think it's been it's being used to reinforce that ooh yes she is this this beautiful sexual being but that's actually just a lie that needs to be stripped away and it's actually ugly and decaying and rotting her persona is that is when you're talking about the way nudity is portrayed in game of thrones i think it's a, a point that's worth talking about uh, dalton did you mm-hmm. have any thought any uh, thoughts on that matter at all well i i think you actually brought up a great point caleb uh and everyone kind of touched on this a little bit but i, I think you really said it very well when you mentioned how melisandre has been used throughout her time on the series as this uh, sexual temptress and i i think uh, that that moment is, you know, Game of Thrones got a lot of flack in its first two seasons for the the gratuitous sex and nudity on the show. Uh, th- this isn't a moment that feels gratuitous in any way, shape, or form because it is trying to make a a very clear point uh, about the doubt she feels when when she is, you know, shows her true age. She she has this really forlorn look. Uh, on, on her face because I think just as our modern society does, the, the society of Westeros uh, values uh, women's youth and beauty um, equally uh, among some of their, their more actually their, – their uh, traits that are actually more interesting and, and more um, useful really. Um, and, and it is kind of a great moment where it shows that th- this thing that she's used, her smoke and mirrors as you guys have said, to to use her power uh, in Westeros, really, at the end of the day, it's all smoke and mirrors. And I think that's what that forlorn look in her eye says, as Daniel mentions, that all the great acting she's doing in that scene uh, really kind of underlines, at the end of the day, it's all smoke and mirrors. And she's wondering, have I been lying to myself for the last several hundred years about all of this? So I, I think it really is a great scene. Awesome, awesome. Well, that'll about wrap our recap of uh, the Red Woman, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I, I do, you know, here on, on Good Trash Media, and, and even on the cast Beyond the Wall, we've always tried to deliver a little more analysis than what you're going to find on an average uh, kind of recap style show. So I did want to kind of cat- tap out the show, uh, put, a, put a pin in the conversation um, by leaving you guys with something to think about. So um, within the context of this episode, did was there any, like, uh, what were you, would you say is the, the big kind of thematic takeaways we had? Um, I, I'll go ahead and start out myself, just kind of give you guys an idea what I'm looking at. I, something I noticed uh, again outside of the the women empowered women thing, which was really really great, was that we are seeing uh, characters consistently across the board humbled. You see Arya who is at her lowest. Uh, you're seeing Sansa, um, not quite at her lowest. She's just kind of on the uh, up upward swing, but still on the run without a home. Uh, you you see. Uh, Brienne in the same position, very very low. Although they make that connection, which is beautiful, but she still doesn't have a doesn't have a home. Uh, and then you look at Jon Snow dead. Uh, hello, do you get lower than dead? You see Melisandre is broken. You see all these characters who have hit rock bottom and they're being humbled by their circumstances. But I think at, at the end of each one of those, there's also this tease of hope. Uh, I think last season in particular, we we were looking at a very kind of heartbreaking season it was all it was very downtrodden all of our characters fell and i think uh, if i take if i have one kind of idea that i extract from this first episode it's that our character things are going to be in a way better and different for our main characters i'm not saying it's going to be like an easy walk in the park but i think that you're going to start to see um you're going to start to see things bounce back a little bit uh for most of our characters here there and I totally agree with you there. I think there's a hint when you when you look at all the different characters, Theon included, everybody. Um, everyone has suffered. Everyone is down. Is at a low point. 
but you see the the beginnings in this episode of of a learning experience for each of these characters, something where they're growing and learning from what has happened to them, what they've experienced. Um, and in some ways it's, it's a, it's it has like a, a strengthening effect to all these characters. And I think we'll see that play out throughout the season. Yeah. I think you guys hit it. Um, I didn't define it as humbling, but more of, I already talked about a little bit, the brokenness and despair in all these characters. And like you guys said, I think that they're all at this point and the only place they can go from here is up. And so that's, really exciting thinking about where these characters will go now that they've hit these low points, how they're going to use that uh, to better to go forward throughout the rest of the season. So I think we're in for a really exciting season. Yeah. You, you've all touched on this, but to, to kind of put a pin in it, uh, I, I think what we're seeing is a bunch of characters uh, have to come to terms with their situations. Uh, and across the board, we're, we're seeing people who have believed in structures and institutions uh, having to realize that these these societal constructs that they have put their faith in are failing them. Uh, and at the end of the day, they're going to have to decide for themselves, what do they really stand for? Uh, what is important to them? How do they define themselves outside of these structures from Daenerys and Brienne and Sansa uh, and Davos and Melisandre, especially Davos and Melisandre, uh, they have completely lost the structures that they believed in, that they have uh, hitched their wagons to, uh, and now they're kind of adrift, and they have to decide for themselves, you know, what am I about? Who, how do I define myself, and what do I strive for, and what do I believe in and stand for at the end of the day? Uh, so it is this kind of this interesting, uh, really, these, these scenes of self-discovery, where we have characters really having to make a choice. Uh, they're at a crossroads, and they have to decide, um, if I can't say, well, I'm on this person's team, what am I really about? And I think that's really interesting, uh, dramatically and thematically. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a really, really well-spoken, uh, Dalton. Like a true Wire fan, talking about the institutions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Anytime we can bring up the wire, anytime at all. I think that about sums it up. Uh, kind of a little bit of analysis for hopefully you guys, you know, listeners out there to chew on a little bit as you're thinking about Game of Thrones season six and, and kind of where these characters are heading and, and what the show really means. And, and uh, Game of Thrones, the reason we're doing a podcast is because in college I said, hey, I think this, there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff going on in the show and it's tackling a lot of themes and ideas you're not seeing really anywhere else uh, or at least executed in, in, in the same way as you see anywhere else and I really think uh, we want to talk about take time at each episode to talk about the, the strengths here and, and some of those really powerful themes and how they're being executed so uh, great job uh, everyone um, all right well we're gonna go ahead and wrap the show and we're gonna pr- actually briefly very briefly talk a little bit about next week's episode uh, but first I do want to remind everybody that we are a podcast for the good trash media network uh, you can find uh, the Cast Beyond the Wall on GoodTrashMedia.com. Now, uh, one thing uh, uh, to note is that uh, we are kind of an extra show that I, I slided in uh, to Good Trash Media. And right now, we are in the process of relaunching a Patreon uh Campaign and and we really need you guys help from you know all all the listeners to continue to uh, put out shows on Good Trash Media and that uh, by extension that does mean the cast beyond the wall as well. If you guys want to continue to see more episodes from us or more of this type of programming on uh, Good Trash Media, we really could really uh, use your contributions. Um, we do have uh, some some new goals posted where we're going to have a new uh, show dedicated to wrestling. Uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, that if we hit our next goal, we'll be launching. Uh, we do a co- total of uh, seven shows on our website right now and. And we can only do it because of uh, contributors and listeners like you. And you can find out where to contribute if you have any interest at patreon.com slash GTM. Now, if you like what you're, if you're, what you're hearing or you totally dislike what you're hearing, there are a couple of different ways you can contact us. Now, the primary way would be to go ahead and comment on in this lovely comment section below here on the website. You can find us also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash goodtrashmedia. Or you can tweet at us at good underscore trash. And, uh, of course, though, uh, you can also tweet at any one of us individually. Uh, now, we'll start with the, the guest host, Dalton Stewart. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at doll underscore stew. That's D-O-L-L underscore S-T-E-W, like a hearty dish uh, that is broth-based made out of Barbies. Um, I tweet a lot, I, both from that account and the good uh, trash media uh, Twitter account, so... Uh, if you uh, think that I'm full of shit or you think that I am the voice of a generation, feel free to let me know. 
All right. All right. How about you, Mr. Lucari? Where can people tweet at you if they think your Sam Wall Tarla hating has just gone too far? <laughs> I, unlike Dalton, I'm not super active on Twitter, but I do have an account. It is AC Lucari, my last name, L U C A R I. Um, if you have some beef to pick with me, go ahead and send it on there, and then I can call you stupid and block you. <laughs> <laughs> Way to keep the conversation oh, going, wow. Austin. That's right. <laughs> All right, Daniel Stull, where can people find uh, you online? Uh, mine's just going to be uh, Daniel Stull 23, uh, Daniel D-A-N-I-E-L Stull S-T-U-L-L 23. All right, and of course you can always tweet at me at Big Cal Kenobi 91 That is convoluted, and it still remains to this day. Uh, that's uh, at Big, B-I-G, C A L Kenobi K E N O B I ninety one. Change your Twitter handle, <laughs> guys. This is the third year in a row he said that. He's it's easy. His... It's easy. You just click, change name, save, done. And you know what's great is the easy Twitter handles I would want are available. So there you go. Um, maybe one day, uh, Dalton. Uh, Dalton. Why do you do this to me, Caleb? <laughs> Why? <laughs> At this point, it's just to see how long I can get a reaction. Uh, you know, We're trying to build a brand here, you self-righteous son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, your birthday is coming up later this year. At some point, I'm sure, maybe for your birthday or something. Uh, I will. I will soundly and firmly jerk you, stupid, if you change your Twitter handle. <laughs> jerk you, stupid. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've never been jerked that way, but. Uh, I'll try it sometime. <laughs> Next week, briefly, uh, we used to read those really dumb synopses that would give us absolutely nothing and almost be kind of a joke. So I'm not going to do that this week. You know what I'm going to do? We're going to go ahead and tell you guys the title of next week's episode, Home. All right. In three sentences or less, guys, what is Home going to be about? Starting with you, Mr. Au- starting with you, Mr. Austin Lucari. You know, I have no idea. That is the most like horrible name to like make any kind of guesses off of. However, I know we're going to see Bran, and we're going to add another Star Wars character to our cast in the Three-Eyed Raven by, uh, via Mr. Uh, Max von Sado, I believe he's pronounced his last name. Sidow. 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 So I'm excited I, to see I think. Him. He is a classic. He's not just a Star Wars actor. He is. Dude, oh, no. He is he's been around forever. Long time. He Exorcist, was, everything. Oh, Exorcist. He was in um, The Seventh the Seal. Frequent- in addition to The Exorcist, a frequent collaborator with Ingmar Bergman, uh, I mean, Max von Sydow is a living legend. So I'm so I was so excited when it was announced that he was going to be a, a member of the Game of Thrones cast. So uh, you think I'm he could guessing, lead us to Luke? Because I I think he could. Uh, well, not in Star Wars because he he, uh, he is dead as fried chicken. He's dead as uh, Jon <laughs> Snow. So, uh, but hopefully, I'm I'm expecting some some stuff with Bran in the North. Is where uh, Max is going to show up. Yeah, my thought on home, the title is, so get this, guys, and my prediction for the season, and I really, I hope I'm not wrong. So, I think we get a lot of very crucial, privy, uh, Westerosi history through Bran this year. Uh, They teased that in previous seasons when we saw him touching the weirwood trees and you see flashbacks, flash forwards, and all that. I think he's going to learn how to channel that power, and we're going to see some flashbacks. So, I'm thinking maybe he flashes back to some stuff in, like, Winterfell or something like that. So home, you know, I like the first episode started at home, you know, uh, the first episode that we were spent in Winterfell. Uh, that's the, the home of the Starks. So that's my hope. I, I don't know. Stoll, do you have any last thoughts on the title? No, no major guesses um, for home. I, I think you guys have all hit it. Bran, uh, super excited to see him again. You know, we've missed out on him for a season. So excited to see where he's going to go. Awesome. Well, that will wrap up our discussion of Game of Thrones Season 6, The Red Woman. Uh, Thank you so much, dear listener, for tuning in. And uh, go ahead, tweet at us, comment on the Facebook, talk to us about Game of Thrones. And we, we can't wait to have you back next week when we go Beyond the Wall.